Welcome. As you can see, you've just joined one in an ongoing series of presentations that are for library advocates, primarily here in California, but obviously we're posting them out there and encouraging people from all over who are interested in this to be able to join us and learn from this series of presentations. It's all under the umbrella of the California Library Association with its Ursula Meyer Advocacy Fund training series. You can find more about that on our website. And if you're having trouble finding that later, just put in California Library Association and you will find us that way. Obviously today we're getting into a topic that is near and dear to the hearts of many of us who are advocates and are working to promote library services in the communities they serve. As we focus in on the second of two things talking about the kind of ways that we reach out to people, our previous session last month was talking about your advocacy pitches and today we're gonna to focus in on, on letters. We wanna start with the idea as we look at this image that we are overwhelmed. Our inboxes look like that in our, in our post inboxes as well as our email boxes, which raises a question for us with all that incoming mail, why are we planning out another letter and hoping that somebody will read it? What we hope we're gonna determine during the session is what makes us open those letters? What makes us read them? What makes us respond to them? And how all of us can be better at being on the side that sends out something that's gonna reach its audience and is gonna make a difference for the people receiving it. During the course of the conversation, I'll be asking our panelists a series of questions. This is meant to be highly interactive. So we do encourage you to, uh, to jump in with your own questions. If you're watching this in an archive version, you can see our names up on this title slide. And you can always go back to that if you're watching the YouTube archive version right now, grab our names. We're pretty easy to find and just reach out to us. We want to be resources for you. And that's one of the primary things we're doing here today, providing you with resources. So as we move to, through today's session, keep in mind that that picture that we're looking at is what your target audience is facing. And you want to be that letter on top that actually jumps people in and gets them to see things so that they will respond and they will get to where you want them to get. I'm going to start off with a basic question for all of you that are on the call and feel free to unmute yourself, uh, put answers into the chat. I will read the chat answers so that people watching the archive version, if they don't have the chat running alongside, will actually know what's going on here. So the question for you in the, who are our co-conspirators in the session today, when you go out to your mailbox, whenever you go out there on a daily basis and pull stuff out, show of hands, how many of you read every one of the pieces of, of pitch letters that you're getting? Any hands going up out there? Not surprising. Oh, one. All right, then. All right, if you're writing a pitch letter, you want to go to Amna because she's going to read your letter right away. Amna, you're different from most of us, and that's laudable. We wish we could train everybody to do that. But most of us see it and go, ah, another piece of mail. Ah, I don't have time for that. And then emails coming in, and you kind of go, ah, incoming. And you duck, and you hide from it, hoping that it'll go away. We need to find out from you who's writing to you and how they're getting to you. Most of us, I think, are probably in that thing of saying, we'll read an occasional one. And a few of us will say, well, I'll read one from a specific organization, which then raises a second question to keep in mind as you are writing your pitch letters. What makes you open that rare letter that you do open, unless you're Amna and you open all of them? Actually, Amna, what makes you open all your letters? That's kind of a curiosity that's really well worth pursuing. always very much excited about anything that comes to my library as i've been working in in school libraries so you know that school library always gives you some awesome thing new books coming up new novels coming up anything new that is coming up so it's very important to open up any letters that are from vendors from publishers any new thing that's coming into our country actually in our side of country anything that's coming new from the other side is very important to be get yourself updated with uh, to this, to children are very much updated more than you are as a, as a librarian. I need to be uh, up to date and up to mark uh, to, to communicate with them in the better way. I need to pitch myself with everything that's coming up to me. I cannot miss a single thing out there. Thank you. And that actually helps us to keep to our promise when you read the announcement for this session and we were telling you what you were going to get. One of the things was we said identify at least three elements found in successful advocacy pitch letters. And you're hearing from Amna that it's gotta be useful. It's gotta be intriguing to you. So when you are writing those letters, be useful. Anybody else, what makes you open your letters? Somebody else must be opening letters. I, I'll, Pat, um, yes. Well, I'll tell you what makes me not open a letter. Okay, and that's equally um, important. Okay, and that's when I receive over and over 
from the same particular organizations or nonprofits. And I just don't feel that they are using the message. The message becomes watered down and to me. And so therefore, um, when I'm getting something that I don't usually get, uh, and it's very important and dear to me, like a, a, a very important organization, I will definitely take the time to read it. But there are certain groups that I uh, get, like I'm sure all of you do, where it's just, is that the best use of you guys' time and also of the money I'm giving? And so I kind of like, ooh, I, in fact, I've contacted a couple of them and said, well, why don't you use your money in a better way? Because sending something out every three weeks is like a little ridiculous to me. Um, but that's just me. I'm just... Let me tell you, that's not just you. I'm sure a, a bunch of us on this call, I see the nodding heads. It's like, yeah, your favorite organization sending you stuff. You donated maybe $20. It was hard earned $20 for you for the entire year. And you feel like they spent that $20 on producing a letter asking you for more money. It's all about the perception there and about the usefulness of it. So again, we're talking it is, about- It oh, is, although, yes. although I, I, will, I will chime in and say that marketing people will tell you that it takes seven letters to get someone's attention. And so it depends on what those seven contacts, whatever it is. So it kind of depends on what those messages are. And I absolutely agree with Pat that, you know, do I need another letter from the people that I sent 20 bucks to five years ago? But, but having been in the marketing side, I also know that this is their last chance to kind of get you. And if they find you in a weak moment, it's a, it's a win. If you send them 20 more bucks, then it is worth their time because then they still have some more time to go for you. So, and I think that we should look at politicians that very same way. So the more we talk to them, <laughs> the more they pay attention. Back to you, Mr. Signorelli. Actually, let's take advantage of the fact that as you're noticing here, we didn't do the, the standard thing of telling you where the restrooms are and telling you everybody's name up front. We wanted to engage you right away. What we're planning on doing as we work through this is each time one of our formal panelists comes in, they will take that event, that opportunity to tell you a little about themselves. So Deborah, in addition to what you just said, tell us about your background and what brings you to pitch letters for libraries. Thank you. Um, and I, I forgot, we were given that instruction. That's all right. Now that's what I'm here <laughs> to remind us to do. Um, I, I wear a number of hats. I got involved with the Friends of the Library in San Francisco a long time ago, just as just as they were starting to build the new main library and then do the branch renovations. And so I was fortunate enough to be on the board of the Friends and then was on the staff of the Friends. Um, and then someone on the Friends board dragged me to a California Library Association conference. And I thought, oh, that's very interesting. And I had also, my dad worked for the feds. And so I always thought that the federal stuff was really the important thing. But then ALA came to San Francisco and suddenly the chain from local to federal became very clear in my head and and I learned that federal dollars trickle down to the state trickle down to the local and so all of the kinds of conversations that we're talking about today matter it matters when you talk to your local politicians when you talk to your local funders it matters when you talk to people who are in the state and it also matters when you're talking about the national. And I would say, I would say now, now that we are an international um, seminar, it, it's also important to think about the world. You know what, in, in fact, is going on. But um, so that's that's uh, that's that's. And I'm also on the United for Libraries um, board in, and that is a division of the American Library Association that focuses on friends, trustees, and other advocates. Um, and I'm on the legislative committee of the California Library Association and the board of the California. California Public Library Advocates, which is a state organization that um, really tries to give friends and foundations uh, tools that they need as well. That was lengthy, but so I'm old. That, that, so <laughs> written a letter or two in your time to pitch things, Deborah. I have written a letter or two, and in fact, CPLA has given classes at CLA conferences about how to give letters, but it's not just letters. I would also say that telephone calls, um, are incredibly important as well. And so maybe that's going to be a subset of our conversations today, because I think sometimes, sometimes um, introverts like to write letters sometimes um, when a telephone call uh, is actually better and more direct. I would suggest that now we've got two elements of, of at least three that we're going to throw out there. We've got Omna's idea that the letter's got to be useful to you. It's got to get, be something meaningful. And what I'm hearing is an undercurrent from Pat and from Deborah here. Is it also has to be personal. For me, as somebody who's written pitch letters and has done fundraising and gets out in a community and actually works on big projects in and outside of libraries, 
my feeling has always been that that letter or that grant application or whatever you're doing to get the action you want is the culmination, not the beginning of a process. Those six or seven letters that Deborah's talking about, if they're coming from an organization that you're peripherally involved in, but you don't really have a personal connection to, they can write you all night long and it's never going to get your attention. But if you already have had contact with people from that organization and it's something that you care for and they tell you, here's what we're going to do and here's what the result would be, then they've got your interest. And if they consistently are sending you that kind of letter, then you're more likely to want to open and say, oh, here they are. Let's find out what the next thing is because I want to help. And there's the word to keep in mind, engagement. Engagement is not just writing a letter. It's making sure that you know people. And I'm going to encourage panelists throughout this, as we've already seen with Deborah and with me, to not just take as gospel truth the things I'm putting out. We did not actually write out a whole script for this because we bring different experiences here. We bring different possibilities. And so you may hear some contradictory things, but it gives you an idea that there's not one size fitting all here. It has to be useful. It has to be personal. And personalization means we look at our situations and we make those letters meaningful. One other person from the audience, what makes you open your, your, answer, your letters that you get, the unsolicited ones? And you're already catching on that I can outweigh you. It's an old facilitator <laughs> technique. Those of you who've been in our se sessions know that we will just sit here in silence and go, oh, this is uncomfortable. I better answer. So your turn. Suddenly everybody flees the room. Paul, I'm happy to jump in and to Please, give, Crystal, and give our participants a little more time. So I'm Crystal Miles. I'm a public services manager with Sacramento Public Library, and I can almost see the state capitol from my office window. Um, so, you know, just in the last year, I've really felt a pull to work um, more closely with advocacy groups because I, I work, um, you know, I've worked most of my library career on the front lines and really, um, focused on that personal engagement, the personal stories, the personal connection. And then I you know, had kind of a light went off when I attended um, these workshops last year that, oh, that's advocacy, right? It's not all about high level communication um, with legislation or for funding or for you know, larger level funding, but it's also those daily connections that are, are part of what we're doing here. So um, to answer the question on what makes me want to open, you know, whether it's a, a physical letter that I get in the mail or an email, um, it's that personal connection that, um, you know, Paul just kind of hit the nail on the head there that when you have that personal connection, you're more likely to engage with it. And as Pat said before we started this morning, um, right now their organization they're planting the seeds or they've been planting the seeds and so when i think about writing a letter it's going to be way more impactful if i've already planted those seeds if i've already sparked that personal connection then they're going to know who i am i've even received letters from um, an organization or a person in an organization that maybe i hadn't seen for a while and out on the outside of the envelope they say Hi, Crystal, hope you're doing well, right? And so it's like, oh, they know me. I'm gonna open that letter. Um, if it's handwritten, I'm more likely to open it than if it's you know, just a printed out standard um, letter. But, and, and again, with email, if, it, if you open it up, like, you know, it was so great meeting you last month at this event. And so really, I think part of the, the work leading up to the letters are getting out there, you know, physically in person is best. Um, making phone calls and then leading up to that letter is going to have a greater impact. We got an interesting comment in the chat. I love you. First of all, I'm not even sure how to pronounce the name. Is it Arion? Yes. Thank you. Arion, they comment here with one that seems a little silly about the weight or thickness of the envelope. Interesting observation. Tell us why why that matters to you. Um, so the advocacy work that I'm more familiar with um, is outside of the world of libraries. Um, so sometimes, you know, getting a campaign email or a campaign letter that's a little heavy or thick is just like, okay, this is going to be a long letter that I don't know. How many things am I going to have to sign, send back out? Do I have a stamp to use the envelope that they have? Those kind of things. So sometimes it's like the smaller the letter, <laughs> I'm more willing to at least open it and see what it's all about. That's a really great observation because we're talking here about time management. 
you've got a hundred letters that pop into your, your incoming box every day, or if you're looking at your home stuff, 10 or 20 things that are coming in, you don't have a lot of time for it. So you want to look at the things, A, that, that you're expecting or that seem to offer you possibilities. And another thing is somebody that was kind enough and thoughtful enough and empathetic enough to realize what Arian just said. I don't want to read 20 pages from a stranger. Tell me what you want. And if you made it look too big and too daunting, I may not even bother to open it. There's a direct line in my own garage where our mail comes in from the little box on the garage door to the recycle bin that's about two feet away. And I'll tell you about 80% of the stuff that comes from organizations I don't know follows that route very nicely. And the house never has to see that stuff. So keep in mind what Arian just said. And as writers, keep in mind something that works for those of us that have done news writing or newsletter writing at any point in your career you need to say the most important thing in your first line. If you do not hook them then, you ain't gonna hook them. Don't bury the lead. Don't exactly. bury the lead. Come on, so, well, actually, let's keep that thought coming. Let's come back to the actual mechanics of it. I don't wanna to get too far into this without bringing in our, our third panelist here, Megan. Megan's from the American Library Association. We're really happy to have her here because she, like Deborah, has written a couple of pitch letters in her time. Megan, give us a bit of background on yourself and then talk about what makes you open those letters that you get, if anything. Thanks, Paul, and thanks for allowing me to join you today. I'm happy to be here. Um, as Paul said, I'm with the American Library Association. I am the Deputy Director of State Advocacy. So I work with all 50 states plus DC and a few uh, of our uh, territories, um, but primarily the, the 50. And um, I, because of that, get a lot of email every day. And it has gotten worse in the pandemic, as I, I'm sure it has for most of you. And there are a couple of things, and I think, you know, several of them you've already hit on. I cannot possibly get through all my email in a single day. I just can't. So I have to prioritize what I open. And I do try to go back and clean up what I've missed. Um, but I will tell you, it is a challenge and I'm getting less email than your local elected officials. So, um, you know, just consider the, uh, um, you know, the situation that they're facing. And I would, um, you know, in addition to echoing what has already been said, I would say two additional things. One is that I open my email box every morning with a list of things that I have to accomplish. And if any of those emails can help me check something off my list in a favorable way, I am going to prioritize those emails. Or, you know, in, in the case of a handwritten letter or a typed letter that comes via email, I'm via regular mail. Um, but, you know, primarily I am communicating via email these days, as are most of you. Uh, the second thing is, and I think that this is, something that reflects the time that we're in right now, um, I would say that your subject line really matters. And if you take a look at the way people engage in conversation, I think there are two things that are really important to keep in mind. Any single communication you have is an opportunity to build or burn a bridge. And um, it should never your relationship with a legislator or a local decision maker should never come down to a single letter, uh, but you can do great uh, harm or have a, a very favorable impact on your relationship, depending upon how you approach that person. You never, never want to burn a bridge, um, even if you disagree with someone. Um, the second thing, though, is that the, you know, we're in a moment where everything is sort of hyper dramatic. So, um, you know, the world is going to end if you don't open this email or, um, you know, your action is going to uh, destroy the lives of people um, across the entire state. Um, I think it's really important to uh, be solution focused right out of the gate and give people an opportunity uh, for a win for themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, consider positive framing that allows someone to uh, clock a win and position their decision as uh, not only good for the person who's asking, but good for uh, themselves as well. 
You hit on a very important thing here, Megan. I'd love all three of you to, to respond to this. When you look at your subject lines in emails and you're doing your pitch letters, do you find it useful to use a phrase that we often see, last chance to? Like, last chance to subscribe, last chance to save a puppy, last chance to build your library. Do you ever use that? Why not? I'll hop in and then uh, others can improve upon what I've said. I think there are a couple of things. One is, um, you know, that's in some ways sort of that hyper speak. It's like, if you say that, it really had better be your a last chance because you are about to destroy your credibility if you come back to people and ask them to do the same thing again. Um, so I think that it really can damage your credibility. Um, and the other thing is that um, people usually make their decisions based on what they can accomplish and not what you're trying to accomplish. So um, I think you want to frame it in a way that gives people something to grasp onto rather than something that they can just watch go by. Yeah, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but when I see those notes from organizations that I do support occasionally, and it says, last chance to subscribe or last chance to help us out, it's like, oh, please make it so. I hope this is the last time I have to throw your emails away or your, your printed letters away. But Megan, again, you've talked about something that we don't say explicitly enough when we're talking about the art of writing pitch letters and trying to, to promote positive action. And that's it. We want to make that reader-centric rather than organization-centric. I have for years and years worked with, with different organizations, a lot of library directors, when they talk about how do we collaborate with the community. And my first suggestion to them is think about what they want. Ask them what they want, listen to what they want, and then look for the overlap. Because if they tell you they want to do something and you're trying to do the same thing, you say, great, we're doing that too. What can we do together? And the sooner you insert that we into it and apply collaboration, I think the more effective you're going to be with your pitch letters, the more effective we're going to be. Crystal Deborah, anything you want to add about that whole thing of last chance to in a subject line and what the subject line should actually say? Sure. Actually, I think that people who are reading that are going to say, oh, please, your poor planning is not my problem. <laughs> so it always has to be we. We should, you know, this is, I, I think, I think if you can, if you can, as, as Megan said, put yourselves in their space. Why, why is this important to them? Why is this important to them? And, and make it easy for them to respond. That's also another key thing in letters. Make it easy for them to whatever it is. Make it easy for the, put a link in the email. Put a, put a, put a big sign on your website that says, here's where you give me money. Make it easy, as easy as lower all the barriers you can. Again, I know Deborah's doing this off the top of her head, and I know she's in her letters she's going to be much more paused than what she just said. But instead of that, here's where you give me money. It's here's where you help us build that library that you so desperately need. Yes, here's that's where true. You can help <laughs> there us you go. Feed a hundred more children <laughs> through the li uh, libraries at lunch. Or what are we calling it, Deborah? The lunch program statewide. Uh, lunch at the library. Lunch at the library. Yes, lunch yeah. at the library. Mm -hmm. So here's how you can help us feed another children, another hundred children this summer through lunch at the libraries. That's your call to action. And it's implicit in that, that we either need your money or we need you to call your legislator to vote for that piece of legislation or whatever the action is, but make that real. Crystal, what do you want to add about subject lines and the call for sure. public action? Well, I am in agreement with everything that's been said. I mean, when we see that kind of canned um, last chance or whatever incendiary, um, you know, that's a turnoff to me. And I imagine it's for most people and we see it, we're inundated by it. And I totally agree with what Megan was talking about that, you know, for someone like her or for many of us that we're so busy that we have to prioritize. And, you know, we, we may not be able to prioritize what someone else needs for the day, but if it's going to impact what you're doing or make your life easier or working together toward the same goal, um, that's that's what's going to get hooked and i think you know it's not accurate in every case but i think the slow burn or the long game is what's important here and so even if someone doesn't get back to you you know you follow up and in that subject line say 
you know, just following up on my last email, when I get that, then I'm like, oh, shoot, I really need to get back to this person, you know, because I, I am sure I don't have as full of an inbox as Megan does, but I also cannot keep up with my email. If I, if I take a day off, I come back to 300 unread emails and, um, and I can't, you know, they're not spam. So it's, um, really staying on top of these things, um, is important. And so sometimes it is that, um, repeat, but authentic and putting that connection in in that subject line or um, following up on our conversation um, just checking in about our conversation and then starting out with um, i really liked what you said paul about bringing in the we um, i was even thinking like when you first reach out to someone i was thinking of a local um, um, congressperson here that his um, goals align with us but if I just reach out and say, we need you to do this, he's, he's not going to have time for that. So it's more like we're working on the same things. Can we, can we set up a time to meet and discuss how we can help each other, support each other, right? So sorry, I'm getting off track there. But um, even in that subject line, it's making that connection, that personal connection. I think of this phrase you just heard from Crystal, the slow, uh, slow burn for the long game. We are in this for the long haul, folks. Unless you're doing an emergency campaign where your library is going to close down two weeks from now, then you're back to what you heard from one of the panelists earlier. Your crisis is not my problem. The fact that you waited this long is not something that's going to win my heart. Show me that you're reasonable and that you're responsible, and then we can work together on long-term things, and we will produce something. So that phrase that Chris was just giving us, that slow burn for the long game or the long haul, so I mean, really keep in mind, put that as one of your mantras as you are writing your notes and building your relationships. An underlying theme here that comes out in, in many of the other sessions we've already had is the idea that you not, don't necessarily, if you're targeting legislators, have to write directly to the legislator. If you have built up relationships with the legislative aides, you have gold in the bank. Those are those people who make things happen and they're the ones that get the senator or the assembly person or the, you know, whatever rep you're looking at, that's what gets the attention. Deborah, you look like you have something to add. You know, I do. I, I, have, a, I have a story to tell. Please. When I lived in San Francisco, Nancy Pelosi, of course, was my representative. Um, and over the years, I would go to Washington and, and we would and exchange correspondence and that sort of thing. But there's a day called National Library Legislative Day. And I would, and I, I um, for a number of years and still I think um, I'm organizing the California contingent when when it comes to comes to Washington and so I got to know her personal chief of staff and we would exchange letters or just notes um, and then she went to a different job that was fine I got to know the new one and that was fine but then she came back as honestly um, Mrs. Pelosi's head chief of staff i mean so not her personal chief of staff but her head chief of staff and 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 she learned that libraries were so important for me and 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 always made a point of just kind of dropping me a note and those kind of relationships you never know where they're going to go there, a, a young man who helped up in sonoma county i'm i'm on the library commission but i was helping with a, a tax measure um a few years ago and a young man who put the signs out um, uh, all around the county, a young man who had just graduated from college. He then went on to get his MPA at, uh, at, in Washington and was working for Congressman Huffman. And now he's leading a planning, he's leading a planning group in Sonoma County. And, and so I still have that relationship. All of those relationships are so incredibly important when then you have to bring it around to the next the next major phase. And so just, just making sure that you're keeping in touch just a little bit, just a little bit. Um, it's so critically important. I probably got us off topic, to Paul, didn't I? There is no <laughs> off topic with this. Remember, even if we're not in every word here talking about here's what you put into the letter, the letter is the final product, but it's the process that goes into it. And that's what Deborah and Crystal and Megan are so lovingly talking about. And a couple of you before we started the recording started to bring out the relationships you're building are the key to a successful letter writing process. If you think it's just write a letter and be done with it, you're going to end up in that same uh, train that I talked about from my mailbox to my recycling box. And that is not where you want to be. We've thrown a lot to you in terms of basic elements and basic procedures here. What questions do you have at this point for any of us that are on the call so far?
Thank you in terms of process procedure and just getting that first line out of that subject line. What questions do you have about that process? If you have no questions, you can put that in the chat and we'll go on. But I um, also want to give you a little time to, to put notes into the chat if you prefer to ask them that way or just unmute yourself. Everyone's asking a good question. Anybody on the panel, how long is too long for a subject line? Um, for me, if it cuts off, that's too long. You want to be able to see it in your inbox with that and get you get to the point. <laughs> a corollary for all of you. What do you think about before you write your subject line? Is that the first thing you do when you start to write your pitch letter? Is it the last thing or where in the process does it that topic subject line come in? It depends, but you know, it, it really does matter how you're going to catch their attention. If it's an ongoing conversation, you have to make sure that you mention that. If it's if it's something, an event that's coming up, you have to mention that and with a date, you know, put the date in so that they so that they know. Um, I think it's really helpful to draft the letter and edit the letter and then decide what that subject line is going to say to me it's sort of like the title right you don't write you don't decide the title of the book i mean some people do but generally the title is done after the book is written um and uh because as you're going through that process of writing there are other things that you are hopefully doing, um, which help you clarify not only what you are asking for, um, but why you are asking for it and how it is connected to the priorities of that person. And so your thinking on that becomes more clear as you do the exercise of writing. So I would suggest afterwards. I would say backing up what Megan just said, I suspect I put more time into the subject line and the first line of a letter and I put it into any of the rest of the content. And I will keep going back. As I'm writing the letter, I will find words that are working their way into the letter and realize that's gotta be in the subject line. But at some points I may have an extremely long subject line, which of course gets edited down. And a tip for all of you that follow this process I'm describing, do not put the recipient's name in the to box until you are ready to send. It's so easy to accidentally send it before you've done that final edit. And then they get some gibberish up at the top or like a three line subject line. That's always the last thing I do. If you're responding to somebody and you're hitting respond to, sometimes if it's a single person, I know their email address, I'll delete that out of that box so that I don't actually accidentally send it. But I do put a lot of time into writing and rewriting a subject line saying, what is the thing that makes it important to them? What's going to convince them that this is a positive action and is worth their time? And if it's a, a printed letter that's going through the mail, again, it's going to be on a subject line in the, in the first line of the letter. I want to tell them right up front what it is that I'm asking for and encouraging them to participate in. There's an old joke that's, that's sort of um, not the kind of thing that we laugh at anymore because it's so painful, but really the, the old joke is what's the difference between somebody who's homeless and somebody who's a fundraiser? And the answer in fundraising circles is they dress better if they're fundraisers. You know, when we're out pitching, we've got to think about who we're reaching to and we've got to realize that we want to be empathetic to all of them and to their situations. And it doesn't matter what our title is. It doesn't matter how we're dressed. It doesn't matter how we speak. It has to speak to them at a level that's meaningful to them. And that, I think, is at the heart of a successful pitch letter and a successful subject line. Anyone want to add anything to that or any follow-up questions from any of you that are our co-conspirators in the session here? I would add one thing um, to your note about, you know, not filling in the two line. I think particularly for uh, people who are just getting used to the process of writing, crafting those letters, I would do it off the platform, do it on doc you know, a document or a Google Doc, uh, take some time to write it, perhaps share it with someone who's had more experience, um, at least get up and walk away from it and come back to it so that you are really certain that what you're saying is um, not only appropriate to the topic, but said in the most economical way and, um, you know, really with the best uh, possible use of word space, because that's another important note, I think, to this whole thing is 
longer is not necessarily better. Even if you've got fantastic things to say, you're talking about somebody's time and you wanna make sure that you hit important points quickly. I think that that's really important. I, and, and in the California and in, in the library world, I think um, sometimes when we're writing letters, we want to make sure we get all the information so they know absolutely all the facts. And it just and we have to say it. And, and it is too much. It is just too much. There's a different way. This letter is a way to open the door so that then you can set up a meeting or you can set up a Zoom call and talk about all those things. But do not, do not, do not put everything, everything, everything in the letter, unless it's, unless it's absolutely called for. It's not a grant application. You're just trying to get their attention, <laughs> truly. Annie Lamont, a novelist and essay writer who I very much admire, uh, phrased very well when she was teaching writing workshops. She would say, watch out for the little gems in your writing. Those are those lines that you think are so clever and so beautiful that it pains you to even consider cutting them. And usually that's the first thing to cut because they're lovely to you, but not to the person you're going to. So watch for the little gems there. Also, Deborah has just pointed out something that's essential to all the sessions we've been doing so far. And that's the, the power of storytelling. When you tell a good compact story that shows the impact of the action that you're asking somebody to engage in, you have them. They're going to want to read more. They're going to understand that there is an impact to that. So if you can incorporate good storytelling into your, your pitch letters, what we're sort of coming up with here is an informal framework, which starts with that one line saying, here's what we hope you will do with us. And the next thing is the story that tells them why they want to do that. Then you circle back at the end and say, and because of this, we hope you will, and you repeat the ask. If you can do that in one page or less, you are gold because you're not wasting people's time. You've gotten to the essence of it. And that takes a lot of time. You may have to write a four or five page first draft to get yourself down to that. And don't be afraid of that. I think people that are not experienced in writing oftentimes think it has to flow out magically as if anybody other than Mozart was able to just sit there and put down their thoughts immediately and have a masterpiece. Most of us are not Mozart. And if you are, I'd love to meet you because I love Mozart. But most of us struggle with those five pages of garbage to get it down to the one page of great stuff and take out the gems. I wanted to, I think Megan mentioned briefly, just um, having someone else look at it, having another set of eyes. Mm -hmm. I really recommend that no matter what you're writing, if it's going out to a stakeholder or someone that you're advocating to is to have someone else look at it. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone um, on your team or doing the same advocacy work. It could just be someone that you trust that is going to be honest because I the we'll talk a little bit more, I think, about the including the story and those um, you know specifics, but what may read, um, what may make sense to you may not make sense to another person or may not read the same way. So um, that's something that I just I swear by. I don't send anything out important until I have two um, colleagues that we work very closely together and we always look at each other's. Um, writing. So, another couple of tips from Professor. Oh, Pat, go ahead. I, I just want to say how much I agree, uh, Crystal and Megan, about having um, like a team or a group re reading prior to go prior to having it going out. What we do is we have a, a couple people in, um, on our board, and whenever we get ready, which is we only do two a year for the Library Foundation, and it's for the purpose of we call it fund a need and we describe the need and specifically even down to we need um, 100 more children's books. We're very specific and we tell them the cost of that and then we tell them how and why and we'll include a story, you know, like um, the last time you gave we were able to uh, purchase this many and we now want to meet our next goal. And uh, we highlight, like we have a thing called party at the library to celebrate, it's like an annual report, but we invite some of the kids, for example, who might have received some books and to talk, their family, to talk at these events. And so we filled up a, uh, you know, the red wagon, we filled it up with, here's what a thousand dollars could buy of children's books. And we filled it up and there, and we used it at our gala when we were asking for fund a need. But the letter that was very specific, um, we always argue about, is it one to two pages? 
in, in terms of length. But we're very specific, and we've so improved it over the uh, last few years. And I think um, our our constituents, that's what, they want to know, what can we do? What can we do to help? The, what, what do you guys need? So we decided to start calling it Fund a Need. Um, and we've had different needs. And then we demonstrate how their money is used and by, let, by someone telling stories. So I think you, what you're doing, well, all of you, is just helping to, okay, I think we're along the right path. Uh, and I just so appreciate hearing these great ideas because sometimes you're out there alone. You're not sure if you're really, <laughs> you know, being effective, but um, you guys are very much uh, helping in that way. So thank you for the ideas and the support. Well, Megan, you, you look like you want to add something to that. I do. I wanted to... Uh... Me I mentioned two things in response to Pat's comments. One, Pat, that, you know, image of the kids with the wagon. Um, sometimes when I'm doing advocacy training, I'll say to people, it is not enough to tell someone that what you're asking for is the right thing to do. That does not motivate people. What motivates them is being able to see that impact, you know, if it's a lawmaker, one of their constituents is going to be ready to enter kindergarten because they've been through the summer reading program, or um, one of their elderly constituents is able to FaceTime with their grandchildren in another state because they've gotten tech assistance at the library, or whatever it is, but they need to see that in their mind. So what you're doing is great. The other thing I wanted to get back to, because it's come up twice, is the length of the letter, one of the things we do is write to uh, boards, uh, county commissions, um, city councils, etc. And we very often want to have our letter as part of the public record. And it is important to be to be brief because there are often time limits on what can be read aloud or presented aloud during a public meeting. Um, so it is a really good exercise. And this was something that took me a little while to get used to because I am one of those, you know, four, four to five pagers because I've always got something to add. Um, but if you want to have your letter as part of a public record or as a letter to the editor in the paper or as, you know, um, some other uh, way that it can sort of live on, you want it to be short. Let's circle back a little bit to the chat for those who are not seeing it. Omna was responding to what Pat said and said, thanks for sharing the tips. Very helpful. Storytelling plays a major role to your statement. And it tells you exactly what the panelists here are saying. This is a collaborative effort. You're not on your own on this. If you've got people in a workshop like this who can be your partners, if you've got people around you who can be your readers, if you've got others that can give you comments that are going to be helpful to you, that takes you towards successful pitch letters. Also, a tip I picked up from wonderful writers years and years ago was before you leave the room with your letter and you start to send that off, if you're posting something physical or before you hit send an email, read it aloud. You will hear all the flaws, all those painful flaws as you read aloud. You might stumble in words and realize that's too long a sentence. I need to shorten that. You may, as you're reading, insert another word. The art here is not to read, but to listen to yourself read. If you're reading and you hear yourself read a word that isn't on that page, that's probably a hint that that was the right word, and you better replace the one that's on the page. It's a wonderful tip, and I've found that in my own work to be very helpful. I pass it on to you as something else that I think will work for you. Deborah says, hope you've got the pictures of those kids in that wagon. It brings up another story here about where we go with, with the effectiveness of our work. Rhea Rubin, who for the longest time was a great evaluator in library circles, who always could help you look at what you did in libraries and say, was the impact what you wanted? And she asked a very simple question, which was, so what? So we start with Pat's story. We raised, we just bought a hundred new books. Well, Rhea would have said, so what? And she makes you think, well, we put books into the hands of kids that might not have had those books. So what? And eventually, not to take you painfully through the whole exercise, you come to the idea of asking what was the real impact on the recipient of the books. That kid read a bunch of books. That kid loved libraries, became a library supporter, became a player in their community. They became a mayor. They became a supervisor. They became the person that runs that supermarket up the street because of what they got out of your library. They became a novelist because of the treatment they got at your library and the encouragement you got. And we need to be asking that. 
I work in, clearly, I work in training circles a lot. We always ask ourselves, what's the impact? We don't care if people like the class. We don't care if people said, oh, you were a good teacher. We care about what they learned and how they applied it and ultimately how they use that to the benefit of the people they served. A line I've used for many, many years now is, I'm not just teaching to the people in the room who are with me. I'm teaching to the benefit of the people that they're going to serve. And your pitch letters need to do that same thing. Any comments on that from the rest of you? Here's one thing. My husband is a, a professional script writer. And so every time I give him something to review, he says, what a great first draft. <laughs> do not take it personally. <laughs> If someone says, I don't know what you're saying in paragraph two, because that's exactly what you want to hear. That is a absolutely gift. absolutely want to hear. It. it is such a gift. I wanted to add something to, to that, Deborah. Um, my first career was in film and theater production. And, you know, we talk about storytelling and being authentic and bringing yourself and this, you know, specifics to the table, but that doesn't mean you get up there and you do it cold you practice, 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 you rewrite, you have a million drafts and you know it so well that you get up there and it feels like it's just organic and natural, but you've been working on it for a long time. And I was thinking Paul's probably the, the only person that could show up and just <laughs> wing it because he's been doing it for 20 years or whatever, right? Um, and so, you know, when you've been doing it so long, it, you might have more of that just, um, you know, ability to, to, to just write it and it, it's perfect, but. Um, oh no, I have never written anything. That's very sweet of you to say that. But, you know, in, in deference to everybody who's on this call, if you think that somehow I'm winging this and that this conversation is flowing just because I've got 20 years experience, actually, I've got notes after notes after notes. The panelists know that before we sat down to today's session, we had some directions about here's what we want to accomplish. Here's the goals that we put out for everybody. Here's a series of questions we can ask to keep the conversation going. Even if we don't ask all of them, this at least puts us on the right track and we'll go with the flow. So it's, Crystal's being very sweet and saying, oh, he makes it look seamless. That's a lot of work. I'm sweating so bullets the, behind the that's scenes. That's the point, here. right? Is that, that's the point is that you still, it's because of all of the preparation. And sometimes if you're working on the same goal for a long time, you don't have to recreate the wheel every time, right? So it's, you have that um, experience to draw from, but it's, it's a process and it can take a hundred, a hundred letters to get the right one that feels organic and authentic. And it doesn't mean that it's not authentic and just coming from the heart, but um, but it's not going to have the same impact or um, get that same um, um, response if, if it's not thoughtful and you don't go through that process first. So as we move into the second half of this and we really try to workshop this, let's go under the hood just one more time here and talk a little bit about how we work and what this may mean for how you work on yourself. Crystal and I did the previous session on doing advocacy pitches and before we did that, we sat down one morning, we were using a Google Doc, which I highly recommend if you're at all comfortable doing online work. We had a shared document, we started typing things in, we would shoot questions to each other about what do we want to see the participants get out of that session? How are we gonna approach it? She would write some stuff and I could see while she was writing what she was doing. I would start to go in and edit and then she could see that and she would edit. It's a really wonderful, intimate process if you're comfortable with it. It's the closest you're ever going to get to be in, in somebody's mind because as I'm typing, she can actually see what's going on in this feeble thing called a brain up here up from my side and see what I'm thinking. And she can see where I'm erasing something and putting something else in. Google Docs are the beginning of great letters and great planning and great processes. So I would recommend that that's something you look at. Also, you know, be structured a little bit. If you're going to try to do a presentation or you're going to do a letter, outline the two or three things you want to say. Not the dozen things you were going to say, because nobody's going to read that. What's the one thing you're asking and maybe two subsidiary things? And that gets you started. So as we move into the second half here, let's make this real. Those of you that are online, think for a minute about a pitch letter that you need to do and that you've been procrastinating on, or one that you're in the middle of doing and you need to finish. And jot down something in front of you that gives you one line describing that pitch letter and what it's trying to accomplish. If you're watching the archive version, do the same thing. You can even stop the recording here long enough to take the time to write down what is that pitch letter meant to accomplish and what's the one thing that you want to say in that first line. We'll give it about 60 seconds. Deborah, you want to hum the Jeopardy theme song or shall we just let it go? <laughs> She's muted. She's going to hum it mute, mutedly. 
I should do, do your Queen Elizabeth from the Renaissance Fair. That would be a good way. No, that's all right. We'll give it about 30, 60 seconds of silence. What's the one thing you want to accomplish in your pitch letter? Write that down. Now, for those of you that are really fast, second thing, who is that letter going to? Here's a major tip. Kurt Vonnegut, decades ago, when he was at his peak as a novelist, wrote a really wonderful piece that appeared as a page-long description in a series in Rolling Stone when he talked about how he wrote. And the first thing he had to do is he had to have an ideal reader in mind. Vonnegut, for the longest time, had his sister as his ideal reader. And so he wrote his novels to his sister, and that gave him a focus he faced that awful moment when his sister died and his audience was gone. It took him a long time to struggle to find another ideal, right? Another ideal audience. We need to do that every time we write a pitch letter. Who are we writing to? Picture that person. And then your first draft is just telling them. Don't be fancy. Just tell them the same way you would tell me if you're trying to pitch me on something. Same way you would tell Megan or Crystal or Deborah or any of the other people on this call. This is all about making your letters real and focused and authentic and giving you that real. Ruben question, so what? And you can answer, so what for them? This is so what for them. So exactly. That, why like, should they care? Why they, should they care about it? And that's, but you've just added a two-part question here. So right now in the next 60 seconds, write down who you're writing to and why they should care. Thank you, Deborah. Mm -hmm. Now for the overachievers in the group, that's all of you I assume here. What if anything are you going to do to engage those people before you send the letter? You're gonna call them, you're gonna have a cup of coffee with them. You're gonna sit with their spouse because you know their spouse and their spouse can get to them. You're gonna call their legislative aid or are you writing to the legislative aid? What are you doing to engage those people before that letter goes out? case it's not obvious. This is your action plan. This is us trying to make sure that this is not just a theoretical exercise. We say, okay, had an hour and a half away from work. Now I'm going back to work. This is work. And this is fun. And this is productive. That's what we want it to be when you are learning how to be an advocate. And when you're learning anything through CLA or any other organization you go to, this is meaningful people. And that's what we want to do with you today. So what are you going to do before you send the letter? While they're finishing that up, Megan, Crystal, Deborah, what do you do generally before you send one of those pitch letters? Uh, one of the things that's really important to do is your research. Uh, you need to understand your audience and understand not only um, why this particular issue matters to them, and uh, how you can position the issue so that it is a value proposition for them, but also understand the context in which they are operating. So they may be, for example, very focused on another issue right now, and that might impact the timing of your letter, or um, they may have taken a related action that you can connect to this particular issue um, and say thank you, or say because you were involved in this, I know um, you know this is important to you. You have all these opportunities um, using the you know the magic of Google and. Uh, the internet to access uh, their social media accounts, their um, possibly their legislative pages if they're um, 
if they're legislators or their you know council or commissioner page um, you also have things like strategic planning documents that help you understand the priorities of the community uh, i mean the priorities of the the body that they represent um, so start always with research really understand who it is that you are writing to and not just on this one issue but within the context of everything that they're working on Crystal Deborah, anything to add? Yeah, um, so I think that's the most important thing that Megan just said is know your audience, know what um, they're caring about. Um, I also, you know, other than have someone else read it and, and give edits back, um, I check my facts. So I think that it's important to add specifics. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be statistics, but um, this is your reputa reputation. And as Megan said before, every contact you're making is either building or burning a bridge. And so you want to make sure that the information you're sharing, whether it's a spe specific story or a specific fact or impact that it's having is accurate. And so if it's something new that you're including to go back and double check um, that that is accurate because then that's your rep reputation. <clears throat> Echoing everything. I, I think one thing occasionally that that I try to remember to do is to check my own community and see if anybody knows this person. See if see if you have see if there's additional information or if you're maybe not the best person to write the letter or or make the call or something like that. So and all of this stuff then that you're tracking all the research that you're doing, you have to keep doing that because once somebody is in your is in your radar <laughs> you just need to keep tracking what they're doing maybe their responsibilities change maybe they've maybe they've moved on maybe they've gone to a different legislator if they're a staff member of that kind of thing so so um it's a it's 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 interesting and challenging but um but always fun and always really interesting Deborah, let's go in reverse order of the way we just answered questions. I want to pick up something you said and, and take you one step further on this. You talked about talking to people who know the person who's the target of your letter. What are one or two other resources you turn to when you're trying to find out more about a person you're trying to write to? Oh, social media, you know, LinkedIn. Um, it's amazing what you can find on LinkedIn and who their friends are and that sort of thing. Um, and what other... I'm, I'm thinking that we're going for legislators, but that's not always the case. Certainly it could be a major donor. It could be what else are they interested in? You know, really, I think that those are the, those are some of the key things to, to really look at. Um, I'm completely with you on that. I use LinkedIn all the time. I use Twitter. You would think Twitter would not be a place you'd go just because it's gotten such a bad rap with the animosity that's come over that platform over the last four or five years. And yet, our legislators, our library directors, our community leaders are tweeting things. And if you can find out something about them and use that as an opening first, before you even write your letter, responding to a tweet by saying, just saw your thing about the library. That's great. Here's what we're doing. You can start a conversation like that. You can cite some of that stuff or just retweet it so that you get on their radar. And that's something I do shamelessly. Crystal, what are some of the resources you look at in addition to the ones you've talked about? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> so I think I'm I'm an extrovert. So I know that this is a different it's a different path for every everybody. But I I get out there. I talk to people. I make connections. So an angel one, just got its wings. Beautiful. <laughs> you gave so, the right answer. The duck right, out of the ceiling. <laughs> um, so when I am needing to make contact with someone, the first thing I do is who do I know? So who do I know that knows this person? And that's who I go to. And and I'm able to do that most of the time just because I do get out there. I, you know, and, and again, in, in person recently, again, you know, going to functions, talking to people, trying to make those connections in any way I can. So that way, when these things come up, it's who do I know? Oh, I'm going to call them and say, hey, um, you know, what do you think is going to be the thing that makes this person tick and and it be authentic right it's like we're not making things up to just fit this person it's it's the angle right it's how are you going to deliver it so that's what i do thank you megan you're sitting there at the center of library advocacy land with the american library association what are the places that you start when you're trying to to use resources to help you understand the the target of your pitch one of the things i want to make a plug for although it's you know never 
specific to a single act of advocacy, but more to your ongoing general advocacy. And that is um, the value of power mapping and really understanding relationships. I think we often perceive um, the world to be more hierarchical than it is. And so we think, well, if we go to, um, you know, the county commissioners that they're going to hold all the power in making a particular decision, um, you know, when in fact it might be um, somebody who is not even an elected um, an elected member of that, that body, but might be a business leader or might be a community-based organization leader or an educational institution leader who can actually say, you know, uh, to person A, B, and C on a council, a commission, whatever body, I need you to do something or I need I need you to listen to this person that I'm going to connect you with or whatever it is. Um, and sometimes it's actually even more random than that. It's, uh, you know, maybe someone on a library staff has a kid who plays soccer and they stand next to a state legislator every weekend uh, and just have opportunities for informal chat and you wouldn't necessarily make the connection between perhaps a frontline staff right to the legislator you you know you tend to think like manager then director um, trustee etc but sometimes those um, connections are in places where you don't expect them and i think that those are really important to be aware of um, they are important to cultivate and it doesn't mean that you can always tap into those but you do have opportunities to have people help even if it's just a quick introduction or a quick hey this person i know is going to reach out to you i wanted to give you a heads up that this letter is coming your way or this call is coming your way um, those things can have a really great impact you know, the very thing that Megan's talking about in terms of power mapping and looking at the people who know the people you want to get to, that's how this session actually developed. There's a small group of us that plan out the different topics, and then we start trying to identify the best speakers we can get in to make these sessions really worthwhile for all of you who come to them. Deborah and Crystal are part of the planning committee, and when we sat down and said, who out there is writing great pitch letters, Megan's was the first name who came up. And there was a great deal of skepticism whether we'd be able to draw her in because she's so busy. But we just took the bull by the horns. I wrote her a quick letter and she very sweetly responded almost before the ink was dry on that virtual letter saying she was in. And I think Deborah was, she expressed surprise that, that it actually worked out as easily and as well as it did. But it makes a point to you, do not back off from asking the questions and contacting the people you think are gonna be the right people to get there. You never get the answer yes, unless you ask. And so that's, a, we do that when we're putting these sessions together. You want to do that when you're doing the advocacy. It all becomes circular and second nature. Crystal, you look like you have something to add. I do. So I just want to unpack this a little bit. So Megan, we, we talked about how full your inbox is. What made you open that email from Paul? Did he offer the chocolate in the subject <laughs> line? Um, <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, I want to break it down a little bit. Do you know, Paul, do you have a connection or was it the CLA advocacy committee or Ursula Meyer? You know, what was the hook there? Well, I think that there are a couple of things. I have worked with CLA, uh, the CLA advocacy committee before, um, but also another person on this panel, Deborah Doyle has been on committees that I have worked on. She ha she and I have worked together on a number of things. And if she asks her something, I know it's a worthwhile request. Um, so uh, familiarity, right? Knowing mm -hmm. someone who knows someone. So that trust is already kind of built in there. Right. And now a total disclosure here. See, if I'd done my homework a little bit better, I probably would have opened my, my note to Megan saying, I'm writing a Deborah's suggestion. I don't think I put that in a letter, did I, Megan? Uh, I, there was some, some, I don't remember if it was the first letter or the second letter, but there was, Deborah's name was somewhere. Maybe you see probably came me. In the second, and it just makes me realize next time I write a pitch letter like that, that goes in the first letter. And that's a lesson to all of you. We are We're all learn. learning. <laughs> we all learn from each one. And Crystal, thanks for unpacking it that way. It really is a good example to all of us and to all of you that we learn from each other and we get better. And look at the results. You cannot complain about this. Now let's start to bring it back home. For those of you that did the exercise of identifying the thing you want to ask for in a pitch letter and the person you want to go to and the step you'll take. Remember, first of all, this is being recorded. 
So assume, <laughs> assume that the person that you were thinking about is going to watch this recording. So don't say anything you don't want that person to see. With that as the context, is there anyone who wants to describe either the name of the person or the type of person they're going to write to, what the pitch is going to be there and what your steps are going to be? Let's learn from each other. What'd you get out of that exercise? Okay, is there anybody else? Nobody wants to be the first. So, all right, we did the first one. Who wants to be second to talk about who they're going to pitch to and why they're going to pitch it and how they're going to pitch it? Let me see if, I can, if I've learned anything from this. Uh, Pat, Deborah mentioned to me that you have an incredible campaign going on and that you're probably going to be doing a pitch letter. Well, <laughs> okay. I'm thinking I'm going to go a different direction if it's okay from when I was thinking of the pitch letter uh, if you could substitute letter for a minute it would be a speech or a talk or a conversation okay and so what our goal now in our advocacy group as I mentioned way at the beginning is we are reaching out to all 13 city councils in our um, county with one message and what's really great, I've been researching, you know, all of their public input times, <laughs> there's like three minutes. You're like three minutes to say it, mean it, get it across, whatever. So we are going out there with the message of, you know, this very, did you know um, all the services that you can get? And so then I started thinking from what you were just saying recently, I need to do a little bit more because each one of our city councils are composed of people and that little community is a different community than the total. And so the little communities, uh, what's their background? And a little more research uh, will help us when we go to do our presentation, uh, which we are beginning um, to outline. So I think that, um, knowing our people who we're going to on each one of these cities, uh, that our message is three minutes, that it revolves, what do we wanna leave them with? What do we want them to remember? Or what did we bring that they didn't know? And there is so much about libraries, I'm finding that um, many of our leaders are not even aware of, they, they just don't know. And I found that out when I was doing the tax campaign, oh my gosh because they wanted to eliminate libraries because aren't they something of past, you know, it's like a museum now rather than it being <laughs> a community center. And so you learn a lot. And then that's how I feel in listening to people that you then can come back with telling them, these are some of the services that we offer. So we're focusing on the services that, that are relevant to your community and that you, we want you to know about. And then we're going to leave them with contact follow up. So if they want to get a hold of any of us, and then, um, you know, it, it, to me, it is just repeating that everywhere um, until we get to everyone knowing what the services are in all these communities. And then it will become like, well, how do we continue all of these, or how do we expand um, these services? And that lays the foundation for talking about money. So okay, so Pat, just... let's, let's take this to a test and so let's do a quick workshop in this. I'm going to ask the panelists to do exactly what I'm doing here. I listened to the thing you're talking about. It touches me so far, but it doesn't answer that essential Rhea Rubin question, Rhea Rubin question about, so what? What's the one line that tells them what they're going to get out of working with you to produce what you're trying to do? One sentence. One sentence. Wow. That's a tough one. That's, um, yes, bingo. That is not easy, but that's what we're after when we write our letters. That one line that yeah. says, here's what I'm offering you an opportunity to do with me. Not, here's what I want you to do. Here's your opportunity to do something with me to produce this. What does that sentence look like to you? It doesn't have to be perfect here. This is your first draft. Hmm. Going back to some of what we've written. Um, while she's doing that, anybody else on the call? This is your chance to learn while you're doing experiential learning in the jargon of our industry. If you were writing a one line pitch with Pat, what would that look like in terms of saying, here's what we want you to do with us? Any takers? Panelists. 
I'd like to jump in. Um, I don't want to disrupt Pat's line of thinking, so I'm going to try and do this without putting words in her mouth. But often when we do advocacy training, we talk about that. Um, the unified messaging is sort of your tagline, right? That's the thing that people say over and over, what the marketers say you need to hear 7 to 11 times. Um, and that is the value proposition. But that is like the bow on a package. And the package is the story that personalizes it for the group that you're giving it to. And so, you know, when you go to a smaller community in the county, you may provide different examples than you do to one of the cities. And so you're using different stories to connect to the priorities of the folks locally that you're speaking to, but you're packaging it with a unified message that um, speaks to the aspirations of the overall community or the overall county, I guess, in this case. Crystal Deborah, you're helping her to, to come up with that one line that builds off what Megan just said that gives her a universal cover. Well, I think, um, you know, I like to give examples or talk about examples to kind of help us get there. And um, one that's really easy in California is lunch at the library. And, you know, it's, if you start with, okay, lunch at the library provides meals to kids. Okay, so what, right? Or why? So you keep going down, down, down the why. It feeds hungry kids, make sure every kid gets at least one meal through the summer. And then why, right? Then they're able to continue focusing on reading, learning, and growing. At the end, we saw reduction in summer slide. Kids that didn't go hungry over the summer, that was down a certain percentage, right? And so it's really looking at the core of it. What was the impact? Not the, you know, what is the program, but what is the underlying impact there? And so when you're writing, even in that one line, right, continuing summer lunches makes, you know, um, I'm not saying, this is my first draft, so I'm not saying it very eloquently, but make sure every child in our community receives one healthy meal a day, you know, and then maybe what that will impact so that they can continue to learn through the summer. And here's what Chris and I did the other time. Now I'm going to jump in with the second draft of that and say my second draft line based on what she just put in front of me would be help us feed children to feed our future bingo you're starting to look at the immediate thing of we're going to feed some kids but it's so that we are feeding the future of our community and I, actually that would be the third draft i'd get that in specifically feed the kids to feed the future of our community now you're talking about short and long-term things deborah take a third or fourth draft of that what would you do to add to that you know actually i think that's pretty good <laughs> But we're not going to be satisfied with the second or third draft. The point is, sometimes it takes like six that. or eight or ten. Megan, yeah. you want to play the game? The one, I, the one thing I would consider is: is there a way to, um, you know, put an even um, more specific face on this? So, um, mention the location. So, you know, feed Stanislaus kids. Feed, feed Stanislaus future. Um, that's not. Again, still in draft mode, um, but allow people to see themselves. Um, in this case, it'll be the voter. So you are speaking to a very wide audience. Um, and But I think that you want people to connect themselves to that message, uh, no matter you know, where in the county that they live. And I think, you know, this may be too vague, but circling back, healthy, engaged, you know, full kids are going to add to a healthier community, right? It's like kind of what Megan said is that if you're a family and you're struggling, you might connect directly to needing food, but we're, we're trying to pitch this to everybody, right? And so how does it impact the community as a whole? Mm -hmm. and, um, and to sort of leave the lunch at the library um, for a little bit and go back to the... Yeah. This is why we're. This is why we're doing this. Um, can you imagine? Can you, you and your group imagine what the county would look like 
if there were if there was not a library in that community what would that look like and if you can actually draw that picture for those folks what difference has either an underfunded library made but what what difference has that library made and and if you can if you can if you can point to that i think that 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 and and then condense it into you know do the messaging thing i think that that's a very very powerful very powerful statement so we're sort of at draft six or 6.5 here and i'm going to turn it back to pat to see where she wants to take it but it sounds to me like we're headed towards something that says she's shaking her head now this is really going to be your draft remember it's collaborative mm -hmm. The fact that you're going to sign this letter doesn't mean you had to write every word of it. What we're doing in this workshop is giving you a process for you to work with your colleagues, your extended community of learning to do the things you need to do and realize you're not on your own on this. So if I'm hearing the draft right, we're at, a, at the point where we want to keep it active. We want a, a direct encouragement to be part of us. Let's feed Stanislaw County kids to feed the future of Stanislaw County itself. Now, Pat, like what would you add to that? <laughs> You guys are, are very good. I, I At the moment, I don't know what more I could add to that. I guess along the same lines, um, you know, goes our, we have such, so low literacy rates. In our okay, county. so stop there, jot this down. Second paragraph, rates. we have low literacy yeah. rates and we have what other problem? Well, <laughs> poverty. Okay, um, so keep it simple. Is, we have low literacy rates and we have poverty. And then you tell a story that gets that going out there. It really makes it personal. That's your second paragraph. And your third paragraph is going to be circling back and saying, so with this in mind, we want to work together. Help us with this level of donation or help us by supporting this piece of legislation or help us with this particular initiative in our community so that we feed more children to feed the future of Stanislaw County. And that's your letter. We promise you in the advertisement up front, we promise you at the beginning of the session, we're going to start drafting a letter that you could use. Those of you that are not in Stanislaw County, you can adapt this to your own setting. Have that thing that just talks about the essential element that you're addressing with a collaborative invitation, then the story, and circling back to the ask. And you have your one page first draft. At this point, draft 6.5 or 7.5. But look how fast that went, how playful it was and relatively painless it was, which is how writing and pitching and advocacy should be. It should not be a slog. People should not see the slog. Deborah and Crystal were sweet enough up front to say, I somehow make it look like this is very easy to do this. That's because we don't want people to see the slog. We want them to see the point and we want them with us. And we take them along because we all lift up at the same time. Panelists, we're getting toward the end. What tips would you offer people in terms of your own process, how you do these letters, or what they might do next to produce their own winning pitch letters in advocacy. Just one, just one additional note though. Yes. Follow up on this letter. Follow up on this letter. Let them know what happened. Thank them for their efforts. If it didn't work, thank them anyway. Just keep in touch, follow up, follow up. That is so important because you're, you're not just writing a letter, you're building a relationship, you're building a bridge. You're building the bridge that Megan was talking about. And, and this, this, the recipient of this letter, if they can help, you know, if they know you're passionate and they know the story, they can actually say it in an elevator. I got this interesting letter today. They can help they can help open doors as well. So follow up, follow up, follow up. So do the research and follow up. Deborah hit on something really important and that is saying thank you as well. And we uh, don't say thank you often enough. And sometimes we don't really feel like saying thank you because we think that we haven't gotten what we wanted yet, but there is always a way to thank someone and let them know that you appreciate uh, either a previous action that they've taken, the time that they're making to hear your concerns, um, their willingness to work with you, whatever it is, find a way to thank people and um, you know express that, that gratitude because that also helps um, keep the door open for future conversations. Crystal? Yeah, so, um... You know, I really 
believe in what Deborah and Megan just said about um, following through, following up, keeping up. It's, I think the core of successful advocacy is built on relationships and connection. And so just to know that this is a, it's a process and it's going to take time. And in, in the vein of thanking the person that you're connecting with, you know, maybe the first few times you communicate with them, it's not, there is no ask. It's how can I help you? How can we work together? And once you have that relationship going, you know, then it, it's more natural to say, hey, I'm working on this. Is there any way we can work together on it? Right. And so just putting in the time to to build the foundation, I think will get you um, to a more successful endpoint. So I'm going to say right now for the recording, those of you that are on the panel, if you've got a few minutes to hang when we stop the recording, hang, we'll do a quick debrief. And I'm saying that during the recording to make another point here. Even we, as we're talking to you about your process, we have our own process for making sure that we do things the best we can and we learn from things. This comes from an experience I had years and years ago where I went to a conference and one of the closing keynoters was a team of the Blue Angel flight pilots. They were talking about their process. One of the most stunning things they talked about after all this wonderful footage of them doing stuff in the air, the close-up shots and the tight collaboration that was involved there, they said every time they finish one of those performances, they gather afterwards and they critique it. They talk about what went right, they talk about what went wrong, what could have gone wrong so that they don't have the tragic accident that nobody wants to see. But if the Blue Angels are doing that, why can't we? So those of us on this call, we pretty much always talk about what went right and what we can do better next time. Those of you that were happy with what you got out of this, remember that that should be your process too. See what was effective in your letters, what didn't work, and don't regret the stuff that didn't work. See it as a learning experience. In training, we often say, fail to learn is our mantra because it implies that thing of sometimes you're not gonna learn, but sometimes by failing in the short term, you go for what Crystal talked about and you really go for that long haul that produces results. Do you have any other questions before we say goodbye? And, and by the way, I encourage you to come to our next session. That'll be the second Wednesday of June, 2022, 10 o'clock. This will be a two hour session. We're gonna be talking about presentation skills for advocates. So hope you'll join us for that one. I'll be leading that myself based on a lot of stuff that I've done as a presenter over the years. So questions that you did not get answered so far. Look at that, we answered every question in anticipation. Oh, we were so hot. <laughs> Final question for all of you, what will you do differently as a result of having participated in this conversation? What will you do in the next two weeks because you were here? I can go um, ahead and say something. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Amna. Go I think ahead. you were going to say something. No, I just want to I say we, I will be taking all of this back to um, the three of us who are working on the concept that I presented to you that we are heading out um, with this uh, getting the word out. And so, um, so many good points. I think I really like the idea that we must. Um, keep asking the why and what do we want to leave them with what do they what do we want them to remember and so being specific about knowing who we're delivering to because each of our cities are quite different and the populations and their needs and so tailoring it that way but um i also love you know can you imagine the what the library what the community would be without the library i do like that approach because that makes them focus on um uh realizing what they do have and then how to get that word out and to use it. So no, you help. This has been very helpful. I really appreciate the feedback and um, got great ideas to go forward with. So thank you. Thank you, Pat. And you've again, given us a chance to spread the wealth here. You know, we, we have these as live working sessions, but also the real value is we're creating learning resources here. So what Pat talked about taking this to a few other people, if you do that also take that to other people and spread the word, and CLA is accomplishing what it's set out to accomplish with a wonderful bequest that underwrites the entire program. Uh, I see Julie saying well, something she'll do is she's gonna to talk to Pat about this, where you're saying thank you for the information. Anybody else, things you will do as a result of having been here? That's the real payoff for all of us. We wanna see the action. What will you do? 
Maria, I think you actually started on mute yourself. Did you have something you wanted to contribute? Yeah, I mean, this is my first time coming to one of these um, sessions. So thank you so much. I learned a lot. Um, and I'm new to the Friends of the Modesto Library Board in Modesto and Stanislaus County. So I'm excited to just start writing a letter and just all the tips and tricks that you guys told us today. I'm excited to draft something up and share with our our board chair and then see where, where it goes. But uh, thank you so much. That's so you guys given me the confidence to write a letter. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Whatever comes out of it, write to CLA or write to us and let us know what the impact was. That helps us too. Arian says one thing that she's going to do is not be scared to ask other people to look over drafts. Wonderful. Yeah. And I think we're pretty much at the end of our 90 minutes together. So we'll cut the recording, encourage you to come back and watch the archive recordings that are on YouTube and available also through the CLA, the California Library Association site. And we hope to see you next month and in the forthcoming months after that. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.